So hopefully you're in the right room. Uh, this presentation is called Improving Search, Lessons Learned from the Trenches. This is your last chance to ditch and go to the Section 508 session. All right. So my name is Ron Pringle. I am from the city of Boulder. That's my really long, stupid title. Um, on my door, it just says uh, some guy does stuff, because that's really what I do. And one of the things I do is search. So what gives me the right to talk to you about search? So I've been working for 11 years in municipal web technology. I started at the city of Aurora in Illinois. I've been working for the last three years for the city of Boulder, which is like working, it's like dog years. Um, working there for three years is like 20 years anywhere else. It's a high intensity place. Uh, so the last two years, I've actually been working very extensively with search technology, specifically Elasticsearch. But don't worry, this, this uh, presentation is not about any one specific technology. Really, it's about what I've learned in working with search in general. Uh, and there's a reason there's a dog up here, because I've been in the doghouse recently. Our search has not performed as well as uh, some of our uh, fair council members have wanted it to perform, and internal people, and the public. So I'm going to talk about what I've learned from the process and trying to improve that. Yay! It's audience participation time, so everybody gets to wake up a little bit. Um, so how many of you have search on your website as a feature? Good. Everybody. How many of you are using either the Google search tool or a actual on-premises Google search appliance? How many of you are happy with your search right now? You think it's pretty good? Okay, all right. You're wrong, I'm gonna tell you why you're wrong. <laughs> So search, before we kind of get started with this, um, search is a 14er. Um, in Colorado, of course, we have the Rocky Mountains, and 14ers are mountains that are above 14,000 feet. Why am I telling you this? Um, because search is difficult. It's really, really difficult, and it never stops. And it's a team effort. So unless you're this guy here, this fuzzy little mountain goat guy, um, he's pretty cool. But most of us can't get up to the top of whatever we're trying to achieve by ourselves. So it really is a team effort. Uh, so how many of you in the room right now think that you're a team of one? Like you're really the only person that's working on your stuff. You don't have a bunch of developers, right? You don't have usability experts. You don't have content analysts and writers and yeah. So you don't have a team. But you actually do, you do have a team. So who is on your team? Well, if you're lucky enough to not be the sole content manager, you have content managers on your team. You also have external users on your team and internal users, because if your city is anything or county is anything like my city, your internal users are using your external search to find content on your website. So they are users, that's very important. So the other thing that's really important to know is that search shouldn't be standalone. It's not just something that you bolt onto your website. So it really should be part of your overall content strategy. And I'm using the word content there um, very specifically because a lot of what we're going to talk about today is content. So you, you can't think about search just on its own. You can't just go, I'm going to go get the Google tool, slap it on my website, I'm done. It actually doesn't work well that way. If it does, you're lucky. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, we're going to talk about users and kind of what their expectations for are for you, how you can tie into that, and how you can use them to help you. We're going to talk a lot about content and specifically findability of content. That's incredibly important. We're gonna talk about user experience, but not a ton, because I think most of you kind of know that user experience is a good thing, and there's probably a lot of work there to be done, but it's not stuff I can, 
I can't, you know, it would take another entire course just to talk about that. And we'll talk about testing and feedback as part of that too. And if we have time, we'll talk about some of the tools that um, I've used and some of the experiences I've had with those tools, but that's kind of maybe or not. So users, <clears throat> external users are angry. They are angry people. Um, when things don't work right, they get very frustrated. Um, and that's why they're angry, is it's, it's from frustration. They're trying to use your site to find something. They need a form, they need to fill out something, they need to pay taxes, they're looking for affordable housing, um, they're looking for the bike path that gets their kids to school. Um, they're coming to your site to do something. And if they can't do it, and if they can't do it quickly, um, they get very frustrated. And the ones that get so frustrated that they need to voice that, they usually do that in an angry fashion. So these users are like, it's like this owl, and you just can't, just, I want to smooth the feather down for them. But <clears throat> so they can be angry because of their experience, but you also have to realize because we're all in this uh, political environment that sometimes these people are just frustrated with government. Um, they're just gonna take it out on you. Sometimes they're politically motivated. Uh, we certainly have that in Boulder. And a lot of times they have uh, expectations that are huge. Um, they've all been using Google just like we have for years and years and years. Their, their expectation for search is way up here. And they don't understand why your site doesn't work the same. Even if you're using Google, it's probably not working the same. And the other expectation is, and I get this a lot from internal users, we'll talk about them too, is uh, that the internet contains all the things, right? It's just a big bucket and we put everything in there and it should all be findable. We know that's not true. Even, even in some things you search on Google, you don't find. But the important thing is, even though that users can be angry and they can very, you know, very much be angry with you specifically, they're part of your team. And you need to treat them with respect and the things they have to say, even maybe if they're not saying it in the right way or the most, uh, using the nicest words, um, there's, there's truths that you can get out of that. You need to use that. So those internal users are angry too, um, for the same reasons, they get frustrated as well. They're using your website to find, try to find their content. If they're doing that, that's probably your first indication that you have a content problem. Because if they can't just use your regular site architecture to find stuff, if they're having to use search to find their own content, and we'll talk a lot about this, you probably have too much content. And you probably have a, an architecture problem with the way your site is set up. I think, uh, especially for government websites, that's the thing we are always going to struggle with. It's the eternal struggle. We're not selling widgets. We don't have a one prime focus for our website. We have to serve a huge amount of constituents and uh, they have a, a large range of needs and that's really hard to architect for. But internal users are also part of your team. All right, so let's talk about content. <clears throat> so just because you have that Google search appliance or you put that Google site search on your, on your website or you have some other search and you've got the search box in the upper right corner where we all put it because that's where everyone expects it to be, it's searchable, but is it findable? Are people actually finding your content? Because that's different from being searchable. All my content is searchable but the results that they get back don't necessarily correlate with what they're looking for. Um, there could be a lot of reasons for that. The biggest reason is you probably have too much content on your website. You just do, we all do. Um, if you don't, you're pretty lucky. Or you intended it to be that way, you did a really good job. Even if you have too much content on your website, for some people, you don't have enough content on your website because there's that one thing that they were looking for that you, they couldn't find. And they'll let you know. They'll tell you your search sucks because they couldn't find that one document from 1852 before you were in even an incorporated state. But somehow that's your problem. 
but that does talk to uh, or speak to one thing that I want to want to make clear is that you really need to be upfront about what content is actually findable on your website. So if you have an archive of documents that are searchable, you really need to tell them. It's like, you know, this goes back to 2007 um, for some of our documents is 2007. Um, whatever that is, but let them know so they know you're kind of setting those expectations up front. Your content is probably poorly organized. This is what happens to all of us, no matter what. Uh, especially if a lot of content contributors, they're putting stuff up all the time. You don't really have control over it. Um, they're just trying to fulfill some requests they got from that one person um, that doesn't maybe represent the other 200,000 people. And sooner or later, your content kind of bloats up and it makes things much more difficult for search. And we're all probably guilty of this too, but the structure of your government should not be the structure of your website. Um, we see it all the time. In fact, we're guilty of it too. Um, we do the same thing. We do a bunch of stuff by department. Even as a city employee, and I've been there three years now, even as a city employee, I don't even know what some of these departments do, let alone whether or not the content I'm looking for should even be there. And where that content is located can be relevant for search too. Um, you can use that to help search. And so content is usually not optimized for findability. Um, we might optimize it for visual display on the website. We might optimize it for uh, council presentation or whatever other special need the content uh, manager or editor had. But a lot of times they're not thinking about search. So as a webmaster or developer, that's really your job is to get them to start thinking about search and kind of build that into their content creation process. And there's lots of things they can do to optimize their content for search. They can add keywords and tags, um, which can be very important. Doing proper titles, which is like pulling teeth for us for some reason. We put really weird titles on things. Um, having semantic content actually helps for search. And having relevant content helps for search. We put up a lot of irrelevant content Putting images up in place of content is terrible for 500 different reasons, including accessibility, um, Section 508 compliance, all of that stuff. But it's also terrible for search. Um, search can't find stuff that's embedded in, in images. It can, you can have search that uh, indexes the metadata about images, and you need to exploit that too um, by adding the alt attribute, uh, good titles, uh, all of that kind of stuff. And in context, if an image is placed on a page that talks about something else and you know that's all relevant. But if you have a bunch of information that's just in, a, in, in an image, it doesn't help with search. It's gonna hurt you. A lot of times you have content that has non-intuitive phrases or words that don't mean anything to the general public. You might use them in government all the time. Uh, a great example of this is uh, we have OSMP. Does anybody know what OSMP stands for here? Yeah, me either. No, I'm kidding. Um, OSMP is uh, it's Open Space and Mountain Parks. It's kind of a unique department to Boulder. It's a little weird. It's not the same as Parks and Recreation, which we also have. A lot of people in Boulder do not grow up in Boulder. Uh, I think I've met Two, three people have actually grown up in Boulder. Uh, the rest of us came from somewhere else where we don't have open parks and open space and mountain parks. So if you're searching for that, well, the fact is nobody's searching for it in the first place. Um, so that's a problem. But we use OSMP all the time as a shortcut for that. So you can create synonyms that match a phrase to a word that you intended it to do. You can do that in search. That's something you should do. Uh, but it's still not helping your content. So we're going back to content again, and really you might want to think about uh, how better to present that to your, to your users and really understanding what they're searching for. So you do need to look at things like analytics, and these things will start coming up. You'll see them. 
So a really good example of that is, it's not OSMP related, it's actually parks, parks and recreation related. Uh, what we noticed was uh, we were getting dinged from people that could not find our, get this right, East Boulder Community Center. Um, they weren't finding it. We've got four different, what we call rec centers, but that's the problem. They're not all called rec centers. But that's what people are searching for, not recreation center, rec center. Uh, so we tagged all of those and all of that stuff. That's great, but we have this, we have two actually. One's a West, West Senior Center, um, but it's also considered a community center or a recreation center. And then we have East Boulder Community Center, which the differentiator is that it has community rooms in it. So, but it's also a rec center. It took a little while to realize this. When you start looking at your analytics and you kind of realize that this, this thing isn't coming up. You know, you talk to your parks and rec people and they're like, why isn't, why isn't my content coming up higher in the search results when people search for rec center? It's a rec center. Like, well, do you ever call it a rec center? Turns out, no, they didn't. So we did some things to optimize that content, tagged it as a rec center, uh, made sure to reference the word rec center in there a couple times. And lo and behold, now it shows up in the top five for rec center. You probably all have those same examples. Um, a lot of times that happens with us for uh, things that are council specific, they come up as hot button issues. So you might have something like uh, VRBOs. Anybody know what a VRBO is? A few of you, okay. Uh, vacation rental by owner. So that's a big deal, but we have lots of rentals in the city of Boulder because we have a university there. So like 62% of our housing stock is rental. Uh, but not a lot of it is vacation rental by owner. Uh, so council's referencing VRBO all the time. But that's not what people are searching for. They're searching for, you know, house rental, rentals, you know, whatever else. So you really got to look at your analytics and try to match that stuff up. The problem is, in that case, this is a hot button topic that flares up for a week and then it's gone again and nobody searches for it. And it flares up again and then it's gone. So. It's hard to catch that stuff quickly. Um, and again, you probably want to rely more on your content managers to know about that stuff and do it. They're not going to know about it if they don't know how to create content that's findable. So that's really, it's, a, it's an effort to teach them about that. And they'll, they'll end up doing that work for you. All right. So your site is, but shouldn't be, a garbage dump. Um, but this happens to a lot of us. Everything gets put up on the, on the web. The problem with this is too much content dilutes search results. Uh, even if some of your stuff is findable and it does float to the top, you get a lot of other results that are maybe semi-relevant or relevant in a specific case or maybe not relevant at all. People will get frustrated if uh, just like Google, if you, you know, Google's great. It's like, here, you have about five billion results for this term, but you never look at more than the first five or 10, whatever the first page is. It's gonna be the same with your website. So if something shows up as the 11th or 12th position, nobody's gonna see it if you're only showing the top 10. They're just not gonna look. And it gets worse if they're seeing that little number that says there are 4,000 result, results for council agenda or whatever it is. Um, it can cause ranking issues with your content on your search. Um, even Google has these problems. Uh, I've seen it. We did a big test with Google with a search appliance and it really ended up not being any better than the tools we were already using. A lot of times this also overwhelms users <clears throat> and it makes them just give up. They just stop searching your website. They might, in frustration, go out and use Google to search your website, and they'll still be frustrated because you still have too much content. And usually if you have that much content, it's also poorly organized, which is just another symptom. So for example, Boulder has 5,527 pages on our website at, at last count. That is five, over five times more content than the last place I worked that had twice the population. We have over 6,000 files on our website, mostly PDFs, but they're files. They're searchable too, but still there's 6,000 of them. 
They never go away. Nobody ever deletes these things. <clears throat> in addition to that, we have a FAQ system. We have uh, something called Inquire Boulder that is also part of our search results. It's a CRM. And we have 93 FAQs, not too bad. And then we have an electronic content management system called Laserfish. And we also index all of the content from that. That's 23,000 files. That's a lot of files. Um, if you can imagine, like, if you're just to aggregate all that content together into one search and just spew those results out, you're not going to get a lot that's, that's relevant for anybody. What's that? No, you can ask. Yeah. So, so you present one set of Yes and no. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll digress, but I'll tell you a little story because that's probably important. Um, yeah. So when we started, really search became a priority for me when we launched our, our new website, uh, Custom Design CMS. We spent a ton of time working on that. We did everything. We were using USA.gov's um, search at the time, which at that time depended on Bing to index content, and then Google as well. We changed everything. Every piece of content on our website had a different URL. Nothing stayed the same. Bing and Google don't really care. It takes them a while to index your content. Um, Bing really doesn't care. I've talked to people at Bing, and they told me they don't care. Um, <laughs> So it's really interesting. Uh, so we, at the last minute, we kind of discovered this because we weren't paying attention to search. We had a tool. It did search. Who cares? Hands off, right? We don't have to worry about it. Wrong. So what happened was we're in our, in our last days of testing, two days before going live, we're like, we had this epiphany. We're like, oh my God, this isn't going to work. It's going to take them six weeks to index our content. Even if it took a week to index, re-index all the content. We're going to have a lot of angry users. OK, well, our CMS had a search tool built into it, too. So that's the first thing we went to when we went live. We launched with that. It sucked. It was terrible. Um, it wasn't optimized. It was super slow, blah, blah, blah. So we knew we had to replace it with something. And then at the same time that we went live with that, we went live with two other things, our ECM, our Laserfish implementation, uh, three other things. Um, Inquire Boulder, which is Gov Outreach's um, CRM, Constituent Relationship Management System, um, that houses all our FAQs, and we do inquiries through there. That was another place we had content. And our open data portal, which technically was part of our website, but wasn't searchable via the normal means. It had its own search. So had these four kind of disparate areas where we had content. So what we had was people coming to the website and like, well, I couldn't find the FAQ. Well, yeah, it's, it's over here. It's on a different system. Well, how do they know that? They don't know that. I know that. They don't know that. And even if you explain to them, they're like, that's stupid. I want to go to this search box, and I want to find all the content on your website. They didn't get that it was a different website. Same thing with Laserfish. So that really started us down the path of Elasticsearch and using that as a tool to index content from all kinds of different areas. And that's what we ended up using. It's been a bumpy road. Elasticsearch is a great, great tool. I. I would, I would stand behind it 100%, um, and I have. I've had to defend it. <clears throat> but it's how you use the tool. It's just a tool. Um, so you still have to index the content. You still have to figure out how to show the most relevant results. You still have to tune the way it indexes content and tune how it finds stuff. So we started out by, we're like, great, we're going to index all of this content. This is going to solve the problem, right? That people were going out and having to go over to Laserfish to find the Laserfish content and go over to Inquire Boulder to find that content. We're going to shove it all together. This is going to be awesome. That's what we did. It was not awesome. 
Um, so what happened was that it diluted the, the search results. We kind of had, with just the website, just the web content itself, even if it wasn't great, it wasn't bad, because um, you had a limited amount of content, and it worked pretty well. And you add 23, at the time it was 20,000 documents on top of that, it just destroyed the search results. Um, we looked at a lot of different ways to fix that, and I'll show some of those. Um, and it's not entirely fixed yet, I'll be honest. This, is, this isn't done for us. <clears throat> so we talked about this stuff. So how are some of the ways you can deal with this? Well, number one, just cut down on the amount of content that you have. If you have the ability to curate your content, um, search is a really good reason to do that. And there's lots of different ways to do that. If you have content managers, they become your curators and just make them aware of, of the issues and make them search for their content. Is it findable? Are they finding junk that they forgot was even there? That happens a lot for us. Um, and then have them delete it or mark it as archived or whatever you need to do. You can separate your content into categories. That is something that we have done. Um, that doesn't mean you separate your content into categories. It means you separate your search results of that content into categories. But still, you generally have to know what bucket to put the content in. Um, so everything for our CMS is based on a page. So a page can be a news event uh, or a news item. It can be an event. We also index jobs from uh, NeoGov, so we have that separate. Documents are separate, but we have two types of documents. We have documents that are on the website, and then we have documents that are in Laserfish. So we haven't come up with a good way of like naming that so that it makes sense to the public yet. But auto expire or archive aged content. Um, that's pretty important to do. And you're going to get pushback on that because you might get people in your records management office or your city clerk's office who are tell you that because of, of legal requirements, you're required to have these documents for seven years. They're right, you are. They don't have to be on your website. Um, and that's a hard message, they don't get that. Um, we've, had, we've been struggling with that, working on that. Um, make sure your content is relevant and timely, that goes to the audio, auto expire stuff. But really the, the point to take away from that too is that time can be a context in which your content can be displayed. Um, that's especially important for events. So really you wanted to, and we're, we're terrible at this. I haven't gotten around to fixing this yet. We don't really display events in a, in a time context right now. And I'll show you a, an, an example of that because it's pretty horrible. So if you search for city council meeting, you might get the newest one at the top, but it doesn't tell you that it's the newest one, so it doesn't mean anything to people. So we have a lot of those problems. We're working on fixing that. You know, make sure your content is concise, consistent. That in itself is going to cut down on the amount of content you have. Um, I attended a great uh, pre-conference session on content strategy. And really, all of that stuff that got talked about in that session yesterday applies for search. Because search is a layer on top of your content. You really need good content. So you need a good content strategy. Yeah, and, and they talked about that in there as like consistent content. That's also a big thing. If, if I'm OSMP and on one page I call my whatever my program and I, and I say it OSMP and then on another page I spell it out, you're not helping. Um, you're not helping your search. Make sure your content is semantic. Um, basic HTML skills. Everybody should know this by now. Start with a header, make sure you mark up paragraphs and paragraph tags, all that kind of stuff. It's going to help your search. Um, it helps Google. Google abides by that stuff too. If you have really nicely semantically marked up content, it's going to show up better in search results. So it's not just about your search, it's also about the external search engines. Mobile friendly. Um, just recently over the summer, Google said they were going to start considering whether or not your content is mobile friendly. And if it's not, it's going to sink in search rankings. And I've seen it happen. So it's very important to pay attention to that. Especially for us, um, 
statistically, uh, we've gone over the last two years, we've gone from about a little over 20% of our users accessing content on the website using a mobile device to over, I think it's 32 or 33% consistently through this year and it keeps incrementing up. So mobile is very important. So I don't know if you could see this very well. So really I'm sure this is a this is our search results page. I just searched for the word bears, which is actually gets searched for a lot in Boulder, because there are a lot of bears in Boulder. Um, but what I want to point out is one of the things we did was include search results. If you can see that line there. And the one that's checked is marked pages and FAQs. So that's the content we've determined that most people want to find. They weren't, they're looking for content on a web page or in an FAQ, which is essentially a web page in a different system. So that's what we default to now. What we used to default to was all, everything. <clears throat> and what happened was all the Laserfish content all came to the surface. It was all at the top. Why is that? Um, these are a lot of uh, council related documents. They're really large. It could be three, four, five hundred pages. Most search engines, including Google, they're, they're at their very basic level, um, they do keyword frequency matching. So they're going to match on a keyword. If I search for bears, they're going to look through every document. And if they find a document that matches that word, that phrase, 500 times, that one's going to the top. Well, if you've got a council document where you're talking about VRBOs, and that's mentioned 50 times in that document, it's going to the top. And then in the page that talked about VRBOs in a more concise manner that made sense to people floated down to the bottom. So we had to deal with that. And there are a couple ways to deal with that. You can, you can weight your search results. If you have, like with Elasticsearch, I've really fine-tuned the way content gets indexed and searched. Um, so we weight results based on things like the category they're in, um, if the title, 100% matches the phrase, that's weighted more. I mean, there's, these are your general search stuff. You may or may not have the ability to do that. If you have your own search tool, sure, you do. If you, maybe if you have a Google search appliance, you can. But if you're using the Google, um, whatever it's called, the hosted service that they use, site search. Yeah, Google site search. If you use that, you don't really have that ability very much. So you're relying on Google. Google does a pretty good job of that, obviously. They're, they're Google. <laughs> this is their job. Uh, so anyway, one of the things we've struggled with, uh, I need to point out, is that one on the end here, public record archives. What the hell does that mean? I don't know. I don't know what that means. If I'm a member of the public, I really don't know what that means. It could mean anything. So what it actually means is content that's stored in Laserfish. And most of the content that's stored in Laserfish are public meeting records. So it could be agendas, it could be minutes um, from uh, committees or from uh, the council meetings. Mostly it's that stuff. That's, that's what happens when you have a committee making decisions about stuff. So, uh, so that's going to get revisited because that was something that got pointed out. Even internally, people that were on the committee were like, I don't understand what that means. This is a bad choice. I'm like, thank you, you made it. Um, but we have to change that. We just haven't determined what to change it to. And we'll talk about that too. So really you want your content to be findable. That's the point of this. Do all of that stuff we already talked about. Well, th this goes back to how I was talking about time and context, uh, time and date. Special City Council meeting, 5.30 p.m. That's great. That's the title of the document. That's it. What day is that on? What month is that in? What year is that in? And, and this has a lot to do with our CMS. Um, events aren't separate things. They're just pages. Um, that's kind of created a problem for us. So that's one of the things we've identified we need to fix. Because as you can see, who knows? I mean, that's, that's not helping the public. That's really easy. When I did the screenshot of this, I knew it was an issue, but then when I did the screenshot, I'm like, this is so glaringly obvious. 
Um, so it's not all bad. Let's, let's find some cool good stuff. Um, the state of North Carolina actually does a pretty decent job with their search. Um, and they have this sort by down here. And you can sort by relevance, which is like I was talking about. If you have the, the state parts and it matches 50 times, it's going up to the top. And they also have by date created. So content, the idea there is that content that was created sooner is more relevant. That may or may not honestly be the case. That might be a band-aid on your problem. But it is something you can do. One of the problems we had with our interface is you, all of those uh, check boxes that I had at the bottom for the different types of results you could choose, that wasn't always that way. They used to be in a drop-down like that. And I met with council members and they're like, well, how can I filter by this? I'm like, oh, it's right here in this drop-down. I've never seen that drop down before. It was just, it was invisible to them. They just did not see it. Um, testing will tell you these things. We don't do enough testing. So we move them to those check boxes. But once you get so much content, if you're indexing a whole bunch more stuff, that's not gonna be a feasible solution either. So it's kind of a Band-Aid. But that does bring us to user experience testing feedback. This is super important, especially for search, mainly because you are not a user. Um, I found this out the hard way. And this is something I already knew, but it just reinforced it for me. Um, people don't really know how to use search, even if they're using Google. The lot, I, you know, I work with my parents and they, even, they can't get good results out of Google because they don't understand how to search. Um, so you're not a user. You're the person developing this stuff or implementing it, but that does not make you a user. So testing on yourself is going to be kind of limited in, in, what, in what you get out of that. So you really want to go out to the people. The other thing I learned is don't trust what people tell you. Um, this happened with internal users. We were going around, and what we've been told was search sucks. You need to improve it. So we went around and did interviews with users internally. Well, what's going on? Why does this suck? Well, I don't know. The, the guy in the office next to me told, it, told me it sucked, so I don't use it. I just heard that it sucks. Okay, go to the guy in the office next door. Why did you tell him it sucks? What's, what sucks about it? Well, six months ago when I searched for this document, it wasn't there. I stopped using it. It sucks. Well, we improved it since then, and we broadcast that, but people don't see those things. Um, so that's what happens. It's like a big game of telephone. Uh, so you'll hear people say stuff, and it, will be, and it could be external people too. We've had that problem too, where people will come and just, they're, they're angry. They're, they're not happy with you, and they're gonna tell you that, but they don't necessarily give you good information. What we found is, by working with people and observing them, that actually tells you a lot more. So uh, listen to what people are telling you, absolutely. But when you get the chance, try to verify that through actual uh, user experience testing. It will help you a lot. Even if you do it internally, like I said, you know, internal users are still users. Um, base your decisions on data. Uh, we were making a lot of kind of intuitive decisions based on what people thought in a committee. It didn't really match up with what we were seeing in our analytics from Google um, about our search analytics and the, the analytics tool we use for our internal one. Poll users, ask them, you know, how's your experience? They'll let you know. But uh, remember that surveys can be evil. Um, most surveys are poorly designed. A lot of surveys are designed to elicit a specific response. You see this in politics all the time, but it applies to everything else as well. So be very careful about that. Try to validate it. Try to use good uh, survey creation um, guidelines to do that. That's what we did internally. So almost all feedback is good, even the horrible sweary stuff. Uh, we certainly get that from time to time, even internally, unfortunately. But still use it. Uh, we, had, uh, we have a council member who's going off the council this year, but he was very angry. Um, not, I'll get you in a minute. Just totally upset about stuff. He was gonna, it didn't matter what we did. He was going to tell us it sucked. But you know what? The thing that he used as that kind of crutch to get in there and tell us that we sucked, it was true. It did suck. Um, and it was, it was 
a frustrating experience for me to hear that from him because I knew he was politically motivated. But there was some truth in it. And you, so you need to be able to take that truth out of whatever the feedback is you're getting, whether it's an external user or politician or your department head or whatever, and try to throw away their motivation because there probably is some truth to what they're telling you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I care about the survey and I um, yes and no. Let's see if I can get there. Um, so we did do a survey internally, uh, and I tried to take all the bias out of it. What, so I, I did a test one first, a mock on paper. And what happened was we were comparing a Google search appliance to our existing search. When people knew it was our existing search and a Google search appliance, they invariably chose the Google search appliance, even when the results told them the opposite, that it was terrible. They had a bias for Google. I mean, who wouldn't? It's like, search, Google, of course, it's going to be better. Well, it's not. Well, yeah, but it will be. So they chose it anyway. So what, what, when I pushed out the, the, the survey to everybody, I, I removed the bias. So nobody could know um, what the result, which system the results came from. And then uh, we just asked them to choose A or B, or neither or both. And, um, and then we switched up the A's and B's, so they weren't always matching. I just randomized it. So that's a good example of a good way to do a survey, but it's hard to do. Um, let's see if I have the other example up here. You can ask for feedback on the page. Um, again, NorthCarolina.gov, NC.gov. I think does a good job of this. So what you can't see above here is the actual search results. And then down below, it's, there's a little this here. How can we make this page better for you? If you click on that, it opens this form. It's very simple. Your email, your message. Um, you can continue to look at analytics. Um, an another thing that we're hoping to do this year is uh, establish what we call a civic user testing group. This is something that's tied to Code for America. It's actually um, one of the Code for America civic groups in Chicago started this. They, are, they kind of invented this. And so it's really about going out and trying to get a, a spread of demographics in your area to become willing uh, testers of civic technology. They use it to uh, mostly test uh, open data-based apps that are developed by um, civic hackers, not necessarily government stuff, but I think the uh, city of Louisville, Kentucky, actually uses it to also test web pages, search results, that kind of stuff. So you have a good targeted demographic, and you can track more stuff than you can other ways because you'll know what their age and gender is, all that stuff that they volunteer um, or give you voluntarily. We're hoping that can use, we can use that process to really start to like show stuff and then go through an iterative process of continuing to improve it. Um, those are the best ways I know right now. Um, I'm not an expert. Um, I've just been inundated with search for the last two years, but yeah. So if anybody knows any other better ways uh, to use feedback or get some kind of analysis, We actually get people to, to go through. We actually watch them do it. And we're actually been using uh, yeah. go to meetings and we record a session. Okay. And that way we just say, give them like five things to do. And then we've got a recording and we go back and we've got to record. Yeah. Show other people. 
but it's really easy and we all kind of have those tools already. Yeah. So totally, you know, we'll guide you together. But it, those sometimes are the best ways yeah. to do it, yeah. And that's what we're looking at trying to do is something like that where we record their session and try to have them speak out loud about the decisions they're making as they're doing it. But. Um, so I think the important thing about the Shiny platform, which is the tools to talk about, is that they're just tools. Um, they're just tools. It's like anything else. Uh, it's not going to solve all your problems if you don't know how to use it well. So if you're having problems with search, learn, learn more about search. Uh, it's going to help you regardless of what tool you use. And the tools do matter. Um, tools do have different sets of capabilities. So you want to pick the tool that works best for you, too. Um, but yeah, they, they help us solve the problem, but it's really the people. We're the people that are solving the problem. Even if you're using a Google search appliance, it's the people behind that that are solving the problems for you. They're doing a lot of the work for you. It's a great way to go if you have the money. So, so we did do, uh, how am I doing on time? Okay. Good. So we did do, we had the search crisis, right? Um, over the summer, early spring, some politically important people complained about search enough to our city manager that it became an issue. Uh, and as all these things do, it goes up to the top and then it comes down, right, to the people that are responsible for actually doing the work. So my director got slammed. He turned around and slammed the apps manager. The apps manager turned around and slammed me. Um, it sucks. It sucks to go through that. It was very stressful. It was uh, very, probably the most stressful three months I've had in government service, which is saying a lot because I've had a lot of stressful moments in government service. But um, I use it as an opportunity to really um, question my assumptions, which I think is something that we all need to do when we're doing this kind of stuff. So it started out as an evaluation. It's like, okay, we have Elasticsearch. That's what we're using. We had been using it for 11 months, which isn't very long for an enterprise solution, but um, the big shiny tool that everyone knows about is a Google search appliance. So that's what they wanted us to compare it to. So we did, we contacted Google, they have an office in Boulder. So they came over, we talked about it, we talked about the issues we're having, what they could and could not do, what the costs were, all that. And then they set up a test one for us. Um, they indexed our content the same way we index our content internally. And for about six weeks, we had this tool where we could do these comparisons side by side um, for free, words and phrases, anything we wanted to enter. And we did. Uh, and I used that to drive this, the internal survey that I did. Um, what it turns out, what happened with that is that I, I produced a report, an executive summary and a full-fledged like 50-page report on this, on everything I did that summer to search. Um, so what happened is that it became apparent, as I had been saying, um, but really you got to back up. You can't just use your intuition. You got to back this up with data. What I had always been saying is it's not the tool, it's a content. We have a content problem. Nobody wants to hear that because that's a lot more work. Um, it's easier if you can just drop a new tool in and it just does the thing, right? It's not the case. That's, that's not what happened. We, we used the Google search appliance. We did tests against that. Uh, we did a... Uh, we did the survey, and overwhelmingly, people chose Elasticsearch over Google, which was a little bit shocking to people above me. Google doesn't suck at search. Um, nobody should walk out of here thinking that's, that Elasticsearch is somehow better than a Google search appliance. It's not true. What happened is our content sucks. And um, if you don't have good content, it's difficult to find the stuff. Um, Google can do some things with that to kind of cover over that a little bit. Um, but, and, and over time, their search results will get better. But it was very obvious that for, for the amount of money we're looking to spend, which was up here, versus what we had, which was an open source solution that cost us nothing, um, we're not getting anything significantly greater out of that. 
and really highlighted that we have a content problem. Um, that's not a problem I can solve. I can explain it to people. I can, I can tell them about it. I can help them optimize their content for search. They have to do it. The content managers have to do it. Part of our problem is we have too many content managers. We have over 200 for a city of 100,000. It's ridiculous. Um, some of those people only touch content once a year, and you think, oh, then that's not a big problem. They're just touching one page. They have no idea how to optimize content for anything. They might just be a frontline city clerk, uh, a person that works the desk. It could be some guy in utility building that has no, you know, no idea. He's just been asked to put up this page of content, and we let everybody put up content. It's not consistent. It's terrible. Even if you take search away from that, you still have a content problem. So uh, that is really the big thing I got out of all the stuff I did. Are there things I can do technically to improve our search? Absolutely. Um, so some of those things I mentioned before, one of them is synonyms. Uh, a lot of search tools include this. Elasticsearch has the ability to do synonyms. There's another tool I used to use by Rensoft called Zoom Search Engine, which is uh, you can install it and run it as an index or two. It has an, uh, a synonym builder as well. So you can match up something like if people are searching for open space in mountain parks and you call it OSMP everywhere, you can match those two things. And your search actually intercepts it and then so if they enter open space in mountain parks, the synonyms list will insert itself in between there and say, okay, I'm not searching for that, I'm just searching for OSMP, and it matches then. It's a good way um, if you want to, you need to meet the user expectation, but you have this internal need to describe your data or your content in a certain way, that's a good way to do it. Um, it's on my list of improvements, I haven't made it yet. Uh, waiting. You can wait your content. Um, this is something we do, but we still need to do some improvements to that. It's so like I mentioned before, I wait uh, titles. So if uh, I do a couple different things. I do a hybrid approach where we still do the keyword frequency matching, and that's one aspect of, of the search results. But the other aspect is it, it attempts to do a bunch of matching on different um, pieces of the content. So that whether it's the title, we have a title, we have a summary, we have keywords, and we have body content, and then we also have related content. So we might have a list of links that's related to that page. Those links might go to a PDF. Um, even though that PDF might be indexed separately and show up as a piece of document content, we also weight it. We weight the page based on its relation to other content, so that's something you can do. And those, those weights are things you can tweak a little bit here and there. Um, but you really want to do a lot of testing around that if you're doing that. Because it can have, you could have a set of results that you're trying to optimize. I mean, it, ha it could have a wholly unintended effect on a different set of results. So you really need a, a good test base of content to, to test that stuff against. It's very, it's very important. And you know that's really in the weeds stuff. That's if you're a developer or programmer or whatever, or somebody that's just you know you're responsible for something like implementing Elasticsearch. Um, Elasticsearch is an open source tool, but it's created by a company called Elastic. They used to be called Elasticsearch. Now they're just called Elastic. They do support contracts. In fact, as I'm sitting here, we're in the process of negotiating a support contract with them because it's just too much work. I, I have other responsibilities too. This isn't, I'm not just a search guy and probably none of you will be search people um, solely. So they're the people that created this. They're, they're gonna know better than me how to optimize it. And so that's what we're gonna use them for is to really build on the work that I've already done, make it better. So these are some of the tools that I know about. Um, Elasticsearch is great. It's a great product. It's Java based, so you'd need a, a Java server for it. There's a bunch of uh, sites or companies out there now that do hosting, including Elastic, so they will host an Elastic instance for you. So don't think of it as just a do-it-yourself um, thing that only a developer can do. 
it's a, it can be used as a service. Obviously, Google Search Appliance, um, it's the most expensive option on the page, but it does a really good job. Um, it's a Google Search Appliance. Uh, what they normally do is three-year contracts, I think, for their, for their search appliances now. And they work with vendors, um, a, a VAR, to supply that. Google will send you the box, but you still need a value-added reseller to come in and configure it and do all that stuff. You have uh, the ability to maintain your content through there and tweak it if you have the time and you can get up to speed with it. But for me, it wasn't really going to save me any time. I'd done all the hard work of implementing Elasticsearch. I'm in the tweaking phase. So. Google Site Search is a lot cheaper alternative. Um, for government sites, the thing you have to deal with uh, is that it's branded. So if you're a .gov, technically you're not allowed to do that, but I see a lot of people do it anyway. So it's the cheaper alternative, but it has limits in the number of pages it can index and the number of results it can return. Another one I'd advocate heavily for is Digital Gov Search. This used to be USA Gov's search engine. I did talk about it earlier, but one of the nice things about it now is it's running on Elasticsearch now. It's awesome. Yes, ma'am. What do you mean about the branding? Um, so, so with a Google with a Google site search, it always says Google on the side, and it's a link back to their commercial service. So for .gov, if you, it depends on how you interpret the rules, but it basically says you can't have any like commercial branding with links back to their services on your website. So it would be the same if you're using a weather widget and it was from Weather Underground. Some sites don't care and they do it anyway. Um, we're pretty strict about that, so we don't allow that to happen. So. so technically, I don't think you're supposed to do it if you have a .gov domain. I don't know that there's anybody policing it, honestly. So, uh, digital Gov search is great. Um, I went to the Elasticsearch conference in the spring, and there was uh, one of their guys was there doing a presentation, and I was actually not aware that they had switched over to Elasticsearch. They were, they were having a lot of problems with Bing, um, just the same problems I talked about. And so they're doing the kind of work I'm doing on my own. They're doing it, but at the federal government level. And you can do it. You can use it. And it's pretty, it's pretty flexible. You can integrate it with your site. Uh, has a lot of features that Elasticsearch supports. So they're doing the hard work for you. So that's, that's a really good option. Um, and they recently rebranded to DigitalGov. So they're great people to work with. You get. Oh, monthly analytics and everything else. I'd really advocate if you don't have the ability to do something like Elasticsearch on your own, but you want to go down that path, uh, Digital Gov Search is a is a great option. Another tool I used to use at my old job in Aurora in Illinois is uh, Rens. It's made by Rensoft. It's called Zoom, and uh, it's a little bit of a hybrid thing. Um, it worked really well for our site because our site was pretty small and we had like 900 pages. So it was, and it, it can index PDF content as well. Uh, it's kind of like a plug-in, a CGI type thing, but it, uh, you can integrate it with your site. We had a PHP-based site. Um, I was able to integrate it and brand it so nobody even knew. I mean, it just looked like part of our site. Worked pretty well. You can run the indexer from a uh, server, or you can run it from your laptop or your workstation or whatever. It really depends. So it's, it's kind of like the, the poor man's choice, but it does work well. It worked really well uh, for us. It's got, like I talked about, the synonyms list and a bunch of other stuff. You can do excludes, um, so you could exclude results for swear words or whatever you want. Um, some politician you don't like. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a pretty powerful tool. They're still developing it. I haven't used it in over three years, but I think it's a, it's a great choice too. There are probably plenty of other tools out there. Um, and if you're using a CMS, you probably have some things built in. I know that WordPress has an Elasticsearch plugin. Um, our library has been playing with that, so that's also a possibility. There's a Drupal module for Elasticsearch as well. Um, there may be a Joomla module, I don't know. Um, 
in a lot of these, and, and a lot of CMSs have built-in things. So if you're using something like uh, uh, Microsoft um, SharePoint, it has, what I, I'm told, it has a very good search built-in. It has a lot of these features too. So That's all I have for you today. Um, happy to answer questions. Um, I guess the only other thing I want to say about tools is they require users. I just want to hammer that home, no pun intended. Um, it's just a tool, so you still have to use it to do good things. And the more you know about the tool that you're using, the better off you're going to be. Q&A. Yes, sir. How did you approach improving your users? Uh, so we hired a, con a web content administrator. Yes. Yes, that's what we did. Um, yeah, so we hired a, a web content administrator. Really, the way um, Boulder works is I, I keep calling us a, a loose confederation of states, and that's how our departments work. They're not a one big cohesive unit in a lot of cases. So because of that, we were, we were in IT. We have people in communications. Um, they're the main users, uh, what we call web managers. We weren't working as a team. So that was the first step we took was this, this spring is get those people together. We're now a team. We're still in our departments. We work as a team. Hire a web content administrator that oversees all of the web managers. Get them on the same page. And the way he's starting to do that is to use analytics to look at data. Uh, we have something called uh, an A to Z list. It's been bloated because people just stick stuff up there because they don't know where else to put it. And he's used analytics to look at that and go, no one's looking at this content. Let's remove it and, you know, because you're just dumbing down the list. So he's starting to do that kind of stuff. Um, and we're supporting him as much as we can. What's that? Uh, good question. No, we don't. We don't use the, you'll, you might see in some search boxes, you can put quotes around something to say, I want to identically match this phrase, and, or there might be advanced results. We did start with that, like having a whole advanced tab that pops down. Two things we learned. No one uses it. The people that did use it didn't know how to use it and used it wrong. So unless you're going to, unless you have a really good way of educating people about how to use it, which we didn't really have people to do that part. It just didn't, it, it confused users for us. Um, when, when you shunt off people over to uh, Laserfish search, like the, the only time I'll say that we do this is when you do search for content that, that public record archives, if you chose that, it'll show you the results on our search page and then under the search box it, says, it has a link to advanced search only in that instance. And then that actually takes you into the Laserfish interface it's very convoluted, um, but it's very powerful. If you know how to use it, it works well. So, yes? So what percentage of people actually use search like, So what percentage use search versus? Other visitors use search on your site. So I think it's, um, don't quote me on this because I'm not positive, but I, I think it's 43% end up actually using it. Yeah. It was higher than I thought, but. Well, there'll be 70% of people get there through Google. Maybe they're looking for eWatchNow.org. Yeah, so I will say this a lot of people do start with Google or Bing or something else, but then once they get to our site, they start using our search. So, and really, what the. What's that? Your search box really big and really powerful. Um, you know, it's always in the top right corner, so it's pretty visible. Uh, I wouldn't say it's overwhelming or, but I will tell you one of the things we discovered is that when people do a search on our page and they get the search results, and if you saw on that one slide, I had the bigger search box right above, they skip right over that and they go right back up to the one in the right, top right corner. So when we're saying stuff like, well, I never saw a drop down, where's the drop down? And you'd tell them over the phone and be like, it's right next to the search box. No, it isn't, it's not there. So it's all about context, right? It's like, okay, well, what search box are you using? You know, because I know how this works and I made an assumption and the assumption was wrong, so. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna have my consistent navigational. Well, and we, here, so that was one thing we talked about. Here, 
and yeah. you end up like, yeah, all roads lead to the same place, but is it really necessary? Yeah, and so we did talk about, okay, we identified this as an issue. People are not using the refined kind of search where they can start to drill down because they're not seeing or going back up to that corner. Maybe we should just take that one off the corner on the search results page. But ultimately, we decided not to do that because we wanted to have a consistent experience and that we felt that was putting a Band-Aid on the problem. That we really, we still have a content problem and that's the thing we need to deal with. And that, that's what yeah. back to too, is like providing an advanced search is like admitting that, you know, your content's not optimized, so you need like an yeah. extra level of search to find that content. Yeah. Exactly. And so a good, uh, a good analogy for that, or a good question for that is, um, how many of you use the advanced search on Google? Yeah, I, I've used it a few times, but almost never. Yeah, but generally people don't. They, if they can't find what they're doing, they're gonna do another search and another search, or they're gonna give up. They don't normally go to the advanced tools. And when they do, unless they're people like you and I that we were in the industry and we know how to use them or this is their job or whatever, a lot of people don't know how to use them, so it doesn't help them. What's that? Yeah, so you had a question. Have you found with a site of your size that people are bypassing your site search, going to Google, and Google is indexing previous locations or phone numbers and emails and creating Google Plus pages that is no longer relevant content or wrong Yeah, location. yeah, absolutely. And you've had to assume ownership of it or you have to get a phone call or receive an envelope. So yes. Yeah, I mean, I... Is your responsibility to fix it or one of the hundred... So in my case, it's not my responsibility. It ends up being Leslie, who's our webmaster, ends up, she ends up doing that. It happens not frequently, but it does happen. And that, again, it points right back to content, right? You gotta curate your content and get the old crap out of there. Um, and I mean, the thing about Google and Bing and all the other indexers is that they do take time to index content. So we do have time sensitive stuff where we have a timed press release that's gonna go out because there's a public announcement um, you know, downtown or whatever and that content needs to be up and findable via search. I index our content every five minutes. Um, Google does not do that. They're not gonna do that. Um, Google's pretty good. I mean, in my experience, it took them less than a week to index when we, when we redid our site. It took them less than a week to index it once we started doing 301 redirects for like the important stuff. And you can imagine we had 12,000 pages before our, our site redesign. And we dropped that to 4,000. There was a lot of content that people were trying to find that did not, literally did not exist anymore. So doing a 301 was not the right thing in those cases. Bing probably still has content up there that's from our own old Joomla site. Um, they're pretty, they don't care much. Um, I mean, I, I, I was talking to their engineer because we actually, I'm not supposed to say this out loud. Um, it's on film, so. Yeah, I know, great. It's been enough time. Um, they just, yeah, they just, they're, they, I mean, I talked to their engineer and he's like, yeah, eh, it's not a priority for us. You know, we have, our priorities are in other areas. Uh, what we found is it was taking 12 weeks or longer to re-index content, even with 301 redirects, which is just, that's ridiculous. We actually had to have them secretly go in and re-index our content. They don't do that for people. They did it for us because we're the city of Boulder, whatever that means. Um, so yeah, your, vi your mileage will vary with those. What's that? Yeah, well, that's what they tell you, right? So, and of course they want in, you know, they, they, if we help you do this, then maybe you'll help us do that. And so. Just one more. Uh, how are you handling the, usually the answer to I can't find X, Y, Z? How are you sort of managing, because it's a hard sell to sell the search and say, look, we're going to try and make a better final search. How are you sort of managing that? So you turn, in terms of like, um, if I've got some piece of content that's not on the site or? Well, I'm assuming that generally, well, the fight that I usually end up having is, is that it needs to be more visible, visible, not we're going to try it. We're going to make it visible but through the search. And I'm right. sort of wondering on that, like, what's your... 
Um, so I don't have that battle too much, um, which is weird for us because there's it's a weird city. But I think I think everyone realizes that well, with as much content as we have, it's an unwinnable battle. Not everyone can have their stuff on the front page. It just doesn't happen. And communications controls that, so it's not a battle I have to fight. So you're they not fight bad. it. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm an enabler. I give them the tools to do what they need to do for the home page, but. And then I'm agnostic about content in that context. But yeah, a lot of times, so, and because of that, and because we're such a huge diverse city with um, huge diverse needs um, that are at a scale larger than our populace would, would tell you that it is, um, search does become really important. Um, and, and it is a way to find content. We have tons of different programs that other cities literally just don't have. So we have more content than an average city of our size. It doesn't make us special, I don't think, um, even though we think we are, uh, the Republic of Boulder, but, um, but it does present a problem for search. Uh, maybe more so, or maybe the highlight is more, it's a, it's a high, more highlighted problem for us than it is in, in maybe some of your other cities. We have a very involved uh, constituency as well. They're very vocal. Um, and they get involved. They volunteer a lot. They show up at meetings a lot. They do a lot, um, and they expect a lot. And we have a, you know, very high tech community too. So we have that. <laughs> Everyone thinks they can solve your problems. So, like that's fine. You can do it in the private sector. Maybe come over to the public and try that, and we'll see what you run into. Any other questions? And I'm happy, you know, I'm happy to discuss search all day long uh, on, uh, on the listserv. If you're on the listserv, it's a great place to hit me up. Or if you have specific questions, especially about Elasticsearch or the research I did over the summer, if you want to know more about that, I'm happy to share that information with you. Um, the listserv is the best way to get in touch with me, but my email address is PringleR, just like the potato chip and an R. Uh, at bouldercolorado.gov. So feel free to email me. I'm happy to share information. So thank you very much. I appreciate it.